feel free to skip ahead a minute or two. I'm going to do all my usual posting on social media and such, and then I'll go ahead and get started. Yep, I wanted that. Okay, uh, since I just posted that, I'm still going to wait another minute or so before I start talking. Trying to get things started a little bit earlier here, but I'm not quite ready to go yet. All right. Good evening, folks. My name is Phil Gallagher. I run Thraven University, a death and taxes uh, dedicated website specifically for legacy. Tonight, I'm going to finish out a league I started, oh, geez, what was that? Sunday morning. And then I'm going to play some mono white DNT. So just to flash both the deck lists real quick, uh, the Red Prison playing. The Red Prison deck that I'm playing is based off of the last GP deck list, but I made a few changes, uh, minor changes, like splitting snow-covered mountains and mountains, and I dropped a Karn for a Chandra, I believe, and I think the other list had a P and K instead of another Chandra or something like that, and otherwise it's mostly the same. I think I added one Scab Clan Berserker where they had a random Surgical Extraction. So to recap what has happened in this league so far, I won against a Stasis deck. Uh, my opponent just like could not beat a Blood Moon. They played a turn one Root Maze, and I played a Blood Moon on like turn three or four, and that was that. Uh, I lost to Miracles. Um, my opponent made a lot of mistakes. My opponent made a lot, a lot, a lot of mistakes, uh, but it, it didn't matter. The Miracles matchup's really hard. Um, Jace is really difficult to beat now that Fiery Confluence can't answer it. And then I beat Red Black Reanimator. Um, I had an assortment of very, very ridiculous hands. Uh, in games two and three, I had double Fairy Macabre both times, uh, which was just absolutely devastating for my opponent. So that's kind of like where we're at in terms of this league. Uh, so that, like, my, my two games here will probably take about an hour. And then I'm going to play some mono-white DNT. Um, I've been wanting to, like, play a list with a whole bunch of Sarah Avengers. I haven't done that in a while. So I think tonight's list is probably going to feature three Sarah Avengers. Uh, and it's going to be a little heavier on the two-drop slot than normal. And I also think I want to play the 24th land. That's that's something I've been trying out a little bit in my DNT builds, and it's just felt more comfortable with all the Red Prison and Grixis Delver that's running around. There are just so many decks where you just want to have basic planes as a as a draw that's actively good. So I think like like bumping up the numbers of of basics are pretty good. And Sarah Avenger is also a card that's pretty good against both of them. Uh, like it's an aggressive threat. It's very good when it comes down off of Ether Vial. Uh, and I'm just very happy to have this deck against cards that aren't named Bitful Strix right now. 
and I'm just gonna go ahead and uh, jump into games here, and we'll see how we do. Uh, Red Prison has been treating me pretty well, although the variance has been a little higher than I'd like. Do that here. Oh, what did I just do? Oh, okay. I clicked the link instead of just doing that. All right. Sorry, Chad. If anyone said something in about the last 30 seconds, please uh, type that again. I just would have missed those comments. All right. Fresh tings. Looks like my opponent plays lands. That turn one Magus of the Moon should be pretty sweet against that. So I'm going to keep this. There's actually a real temptation, like if this is lands, to go turn one Chalice on one to stop gamble and crop rotation and then turn two magus instead they can't do that many devastating things on turn one if there's a chalice although the magus might hmm Like, this hand's really good, but I have a couple of different ways that I can play it. Like, turn one Chalice is good, turn one Magus is good. Like, it's going to be turn one Magus, turn two Chalice, or turn one Chalice, turn two Magus. I guess if I turn one Chalice and my opponent Wastelands me, I can't turn two Magus. If I turn one Magus, then I'm only afraid of, like, a Punishing Fire, and I can save my Chalice to put it on two long term. I'm gonna jam Magus. It's a very close decision, though. <coughs> Not lands. Not lands at all. Might be Turbo Depths now. A lot of lands players are switching to turbo depths. Uh, this is a pretty common change recently. So my opponent is now beat, like staring down a pair of cards that are pretty difficult to beat. Like the the chalice on one is is annoying, but the bridge is probably unbeatable. In in a game one scenario, like depending on how many like abrupt decays, if any, they have. Ooh, that's a good draw. Alright, opponent. Double, double basic land natural opener. That's savage. I did not take enough time to consider my action. I should have played Rabble Master there. Um, 
I missed out on a point of damage this turn and like a cumulative point of damage every turn for the rest of the game because of that. That's on me. I just like clicked to clicked too quickly there. Hey Goblin Lackey. Goblin Lackey, how much do you like goblins? Just random question. Alright, despite my misplay, my opponent concedes. Yeah, Goblin Lackey, I know, I messed that up. I fully I fully own up to that mistake. You love it so much. Well, Goblin Lackey, what would I tell you? What would you say if I told you I found a, a food chain goblins list that looks pretty spicy? I'll, I'll show you it after this, this match. Uh, it looks really cool. I really want to play it. I don't think it's good, but it looks hilarious. So, what do I want to do against Turbo Daps? Fiery Confluence isn't the best. I'm probably okay with trimming some of those. I can see Hazaret not being the best. Like, if I have a bridge, a lot of my stuff can just kill them anyway. PNK produces chump blockers, so I'm... I'm uh, fine with leaving that. Like, how many of these confluences can I safely drop? It's just such good reach. Maybe they're just not great, though. Like, if I go and cut the Hazarets and the Fiery Confluences, then I leave myself with what I think is a decent set of cards, and I only have to do one more. Do you want a braids for needles and maps? Uh, I don't know that that's worth the card. I don't know what my last cut is supposed to be, I have no idea. I'll only bring in three of those. Uh, I am not sure if that is a, a Frank Karsten deck. It would not surprise me to hear that. Alright, so what can I do? I can go Mountain, Mox, Imprint a card, Spirit Guide, and Turn 1 Trinosphere or Magus? Keep. I mostly want to draw a red card. I don't really want to pitch any of these to the chrome box. Like, I 100% will, but these are all cards that I value right now. I would also accept drawing a soul land. I told my opponent good luck with this Thoughtseize. Like, it's it's tough. Ah, oh, Goblin Lackey, that's a shame. I'll make sure you get that Goblin's list, though. Remind me next time you're on stream, uh, if you get back later, and I'll show it to you. So we just go land pass now, and with any land or mana source, we start throwing out the haymakers. And we'll 
pass this turn. That's fine. It appears my opponent has chosen wisely in terms of their thoughtsies. Alright, we are in immediate danger of Merit Lodge time now. So this is probably going to be like crop rotation for Dark Depths, and then because the Dark Depths can tap for mana due to Urborg, my opponent can just make the 2020. That, that is an acceptable loss. Now I get more time to think about my sideboarding. I can see Karn not being the best, but it's so aggressive. Like, especially if I have, like, like Mox and Spyglass and Chalice and stuff like that. If I, if I get to, like, do one of those things and, like, Karn minus, Karn minus, that can kill my opponent super quickly. I don't know if, like, Scab Clan Berserker's fine. I just don't know if any of these cards is worse than my third Scab Clan. I don't really think so. Like, Rival Master is a faster unchecked clock. Most of the rest of the stuff is a hate piece of some nature. Except the Planeswalkers, which are awesome. So I'll run the Sessos. Yes. Alright, turn two, Blood Moon. Turn three, Bridge. Turn four, Second Bridge. Later, Planeswalkers. This is a great hand, and it's very Thoughtseize resistant. Stupid Urborg. Let's shut that down right now. No more of this clicking. Everything's a mountain. One click, get there. Man, Pony is really good at drawing those basic lands. So this will probably name Chandra. And then we have the backup Karn. Since I still have double bridge, even if one of these like magically gets thought seized, I'm still good with uh, like using this turn to get my threat out there. And the Rival Master and the Goblin Tokens will still be able to attack under the bridge the next turn. Although this line commits me. Alright, crop rotation, that gets a swamp. Strong. But it has done a fantastic job of playing around my Blood Moon. there. Oh. 
Okay, so that that was play in Urborg, crop rotation the second Urborg. Sorry, I saw the other Urborg in there and I was kind of confused about what was what was like physically happening. Now, now Rebels does not attack. Now we just peck my opponent for one damage a turn. Annoyingly, Vampire Hexmage can be Planeswalker removal. No chances. If I Karn minus, I create a 3-3. Three, three. That can still attack through bridge right now. So I guess that's good. And then if my opponent, like, sacks to kill Karn, my Rabble Master starts getting through. And if they don't sack, great for me. Do you really think I Karn plus? Like, in order for my opponent to win currently, they would have to, like, get rid of Moon, get rid of Bridge, get rid of Bridge? I don't know that I... I agree. I think I just want to, like, get my value and make my 3-3. My three, three, that I can turn into a 4-4 four, four if I want. Like, this would be just be like a 4-mana draw a card, probably, if I plus. Like, I'll be able to attack with it next turn, and then, like, it's like my Karn minus got a Lightning Bolt. And after that, I get a Karn plus if my opponent doesn't sack to the Hex Mage. I think I make a 3-3. Three, three. That is good. So I think pre-combat I Karn plus, then play Rabble Master, and then swing in. I don't want to Karn minus because it would grow this to four. And if I grow that to four, it can't attack. So I think this is where I take my random card. A moon in a city. Uh, 
no. One of those has to attack him now. That's... I always forget about that part. So the Vampire Hex Mage will eat one of those. I hit my opponent for five. Yeah, Jay, I realized that just a couple of seconds too late. So my line was actually supposed to be... Wait, hold on, are they, are they really letting me get a second Blood Moon effect? They are. Neat. Didn't really expect that. Thrust, you bet. You have, you have Pithing Needle on that. It's whatever. So I guess I... Concarn plus, go up to a fourth card in my hand, play a Trinosphere, have four cards, attack with a 4-4 four, four Construct. I can also just minus Karn, create another Construct, it's four fours, and just attack with that, and then just not play anything else this turn. That's probably just as good, if not better. Fake idiot, I agree. So, can I play a post combat rabble master here? I'll draw a card for turn, that will put me up to four cards, and both my constructs can attack if my opponent duresses me, then I can plus Karn. If my opponent duresses me and Vampire Hex Mages Karn, then both my Rabble Masters and two tokens attack in. Maybe the, se the second Rabble Master is just bad. But if they Vampire Hex Mage the Karn, then they'll just die to the Rabble Masters because they can't block both. So playing the Rabble Master should be fine. Unless they double discard spell me, in which case I'm annoyed. But then I'd still have Karn. I'm not going to play the Rattle Master. I can't think of what I can like lose this game to right now with my opponent so far behind on cards. It'd have to be something absolutely absurd.
that like destroys all artifacts and enchantments or something like that. Plus, ooh, P and K and a bridge. I get a bridge. I want to play one artifact so that these constructs are lethal, so that both have to be chump blocked. And Should probably be Chalice of the Void. Should probably put Chalice of the Void on one so that my hand can't be like dressed. Like Chalice of the Void on two for Abrupt Decay doesn't work, and I can't put it on three, so I think I just go on one. Evening, Army of Thalia. Uh, I'm still not going to attack with the Rival Master. Right, because it's not a lethal attack even if I do. It's just chump, chump. This is 3, 4 damage, so I'd rather just like leave this back. In case there's one random removal spell. Like one random abrupt decay on something. To keep my opponent from dying. I think the attack is unnecessary. I think I'm well well enough off to win this game regardless it is possible that is wrong though my curse and grip one of them okay So if I had attacked in with the Rabble Master, I would have just lost the Rabble Master to the Hex Mage and been in the same spot, and I would have been much worse off. Um, so definitely getting payoff there. Um, now, I think I like playing the second Rabble Master and just kind of like putting my opponent to the test. Yeah, Army of Thalia, I know about that. I'll, I'll work on that later, but it was stream time, so. That's, that's tomorrow Phil's problem. But thank you for letting me know. Alright. There's my win. Alright, so game three win with multiple bridge. Well, my hand looks great. I have a turn one chalice on one, and a turn two chalice on two. And opponent mulligan to five. Uh, Army of Thalia, it is, it is a relatively simple fix. Uh, it, it, will, it will definitely be up uh, before Thursday. It'll probably be up um, tonight or tomorrow evening. I don't know when exactly. It just kind of depends on how, how the evening goes and what all happens tomorrow. <coughs> Street Wraith? 
Days. I'll try again next turn. All right, so we're we're playing against Death Shadows De Death Shadow Delver, uh, and three like four R. Thank you very much for um, what I assume is your resubscription, and that like you just missed missed a month or something like that. Uh, thank you for for your support. I know you've been around for a a good portion of my streams. All right. Death Shadow Delver, I was on the draw against Hamburger Young. That is even better than a chalice. Oh, okay, that makes sense then. All right, looks like I'm gonna get Gurmag Anglered, so I'm gonna need to find a bridge in short order. I'm on a two-turn clock. Um, let's see. So I'll take two to play Magus of the Moon. That'll put me to twelve. Gurmag Angler. Okay, so that'll turn it into a three-turn clock because the Deathrite Shaman can't drain me. All right. Opponent might be able to steal their mold of five. Transfer. is going to be like a good taxi and probe. That is not good. Um, operating on the assumption that I draw a bridge next turn. I'm not in any danger of not of having five or more cards in hand. If I play this Trinosphere and then I draw a bridge, I can still like play bridge and play land and still be like safely out of this range. But since I already have a Trinosphere in play, I should just Chalice on one. Ooh, pay for X is one, and then I pay one more additional. Uh, I'm not going to make this attack. So the Deathrite can't peck me back for one, but maybe I should have? So that Fiery Confluence would have been a live top deck. So my Magus of the Moon is going to need to chump block which means I should play City of Traders over Ancient Tomb this turn. And then I'm going to have two looks at a bridge next turn. Man, 
and that would have been such a stellar draw. That's unfortunate. Yeah, so if I had attacked with the Magus the previous turn, the Deathrite Shaman would have dealt me one, and then the Deathrite Shaman would have been legal this turn. Uh, so I did successfully... My opponent says you have to destroy the Shaman in that spot. I don't think I need to destroy the shaman in that spot. I don't know that my opponent knows what they're talking about. Oh shit. Okay, yep. They do. Okay, so I would have drawn Hazaret for turn. No, I would have drawn P and K for a turn. So I would have gone 4 mana, P and K. Can't use this. Chump Gurmag Angler. Then play. Then that would have gotten me to this card on the following turn. Could have gone. Play Hazaret. Attack for three. Or not play Hazaret. All right, I messed up. There, there was a game to be had, and I probably win, but it is unclear. I want to say that I punt that one. So... I probably board like this is regular Delver and go... Rabble... and go Rabble Masters out and a Fiery Confluence out. Although since my opponent does so many things with their life total, maybe keeping Rabble Master in is fine. And like I cut the slower Hazaret over that. And keep a Rabble Master in. Yeah, this is Death Shadow Delver. This is probably fine. Yes, I would like to play first. Uh, yep. In playing this deck, you have to accept that sometimes they have the force and you will lose to that. And you have to just go for it.
it feels bad that like we had to pitch the Chandra there in order to do that. But I think I 100% go for it. I'll still have a bridge to stop my opponent's early aggression. And then any of my haymakers off the top are going to be very, very, very live. Speaking of... So I'll take a minute to appreciate this white bordered blood moon. So I was on the play for that, and I win. I'm going to draw for the next one. Blood Moon is great. <laughs> Pristine white border and white sleeves. Get them. Uh, this hand is amazing. Holy cow, this hand is great. So, we'll go Chrome Mox, probably imprint a braid. Oh no, we'll, we'll imprint. Confluence probably. Oh, uh, well, Confluence can be really good. So, Chromox, Imprint, Abraid, City, Blood Moon. If that fails, we Magus of the Moon on the following turn. I think I keep this Confluence around because it's just going to like close out the game so quickly. But it's possible that the Abraid is just better in case my opponent goes like land Deathrite Shaman. July is great. I think my opponent has a daze. I guess if plan A works, then I don't need this fiery confluence. So I stick that under here. And I actually think I lead on Magus of the Moon now that I suspect that my opponent has a daze. So that I can stick the Blood Moon that's safer. Yeah, there it is. Not going to play around days so that I can keep my lands. If I play around days, I put another land into the graveyard, 
which would make my opponent's death right shaman better. So now I get to like safely play this mountain, and on the following turn, I get to abrade this Deathrite Shaman and 100% lock my opponent out, or potentially like Kozilex return Deathrite Shaman plus something stupid like a Delver. Um, yeah, like I, I had very, very positive testing with Shalai. With the exception of a couple of days where I just hit like one too many Caracas matchups in a row and got really frustrated. Um, but in the fair matchups, it's great. And sometimes in the combo matchups, it does like randomly more than you would expect. So, I'm just going to Kozilek's return here, because my opponent can't, like, spell pierce or anything like that, so might as well, like, use the one that is less flexible right now. <laughs> my opponent says, so fun to play magic. Yeah, Caracas does make it better than Resto, except for when Caracas makes it worse than Resto. Yeah, uh, opponent's not that salty. Opponent's a little salty. I don't know what out they have. Like, I actually don't know... Like, what they can do to beat me, right? Because they have to get rid of, like, both the Moon and the Magus in order to cast anything. Alright, there we go. So that's my, my third 4-1 with Red Prison. Uh, so I think I have a 4-1, sorry, I have three 4-1s, I think two 3-2s and two 2-3s two with the deck. Um, I'm, I'm still making mistakes, and that, like that that's kind of why I'm playing this deck quite a bit on stream, is like I'm trying to learn it, I want to write some articles about this, and, and I've written one in the past, but I feel like one of my, my goals for Thraven University for the year was to write two articles on non d and decks and try to, like, gain good proficiency with another deck. And I have not made it through a league yet where I felt like I have not made any egregious play errors. Um, I feel like most of the leagues I play with d and I play very, very well, and I get through most leagues without making an egregious error. Sometimes I make mistakes, sometimes I make choices that don't pan out, but I very rarely, like, really fuck up. Whereas with Red Prison, I'm still I'm still making mistakes that are just like actively very bad. Ooh, food chain goblins, yes. Alright, alright, chat, check check this out. This deck list is sweet. Uh so I found this from a local event. I think it was overseas. I wanted to say it was like a German event. Uh, a name like Christopher Vickstrom kind of uh, suggests that, I think. So what's interesting about this deck list? is that it's a, a combo deck list. It's like combo goblins. So like on on the surface, the combo is Squee, which you can cast from your graveyard or exile, plus food chain. So you can use Squee plus food chain to go and like make infinite mana for creatures. Uh, yes, Thraven University is down. I'll get to that tonight or tomorrow. So once once you have all that mana, you can sacrifice a goblin to give target creature plus one plus one until end of turn. So you can go sacrifice Squee a whole bunch of times, make infinite mana, and go and then just like pump some creature infinitely and kill kill the opponent. 
Or you can use Goblin Sharpshooter plus the food chain combo. Oh wait, no, that's not dies, is it? This is exile. No. Okay. Well, once you've done your whole food chain thing and you've made infinite mana, you can use Squee and Skirk Prospector. Sacrifice Squee to Skirk Prospector, and then use Goblin Sharpshooter triggers to go and bleed out your opponents. Um, otherwise, you can go and like try to do some shenanigans with like Lightning Crafter and Kiki Jiki to go and and do a bunch of like really derpy fun things. I don't know that this deck is actually good. In in fact, I suspect it's probably pretty bad. But it'd probably be pretty fun to play through a league and go and like mess around with this. I don't know that this is built anywhere close to optimally, but I found this list and I just I just thought it was super interesting. I I wonder if it like will be miserable to play in that like food chain plus squee is going to be infinite like clicks if my opponent doesn't uh concede. And that's kind of why I haven't played any food chain online, even though like I own that deck and I've played that deck in quite a few tournaments. Um so this this is a deck list that's on my mind. Um, I have another red prison deck that I want to try out. I want to try Zach's build that goes a little bit heavier on Karns. It runs three Karns in the main deck. Um, and moved one Fiery Confluence to the sideboard. Otherwise it's pretty similar to what I was doing. Uh, it's also playing Great Furnace to like make Karn stuff bigger, which exposes some of your lands to random things like Agent Grudge. Uh, but outside of that, it's not overly punishing since like you're the Blood Moon deck anyway. It does mean that some of your your red sources that otherwise would have been mountains can be wastelanded too. Uh, but if you're going heavy on the Karn plan, I can see that being interesting. And then there was one other deck that really caught my eye. Uh, I think Basic Plane sent me this. So this is... this is a treat. So this is a Soldier Stompy deck that focuses on a plus one plus one counter theme, and it uses High Sentinels of uh, Arishin, uh, which is a 3-4 flyer for 4 mana, Bird Soldier. It gets plus one plus one for each other creature you control with a plus one plus one counter on it, and you can pay 4 mana to put a plus one plus one counter on target creature. It also plays Citadel Siege, uh, which notably, uh, it has the cons mode that at the beginning of combat on your turn, put, put two plus one plus one counters on target creature you control. <clears throat> so, imagine that you go and take an aerial responder and curve that into Citadel Siege. Now, my 4-5 flyer, Vigilant Lifelinker, is attacking in, and then the next turn, you know, it is a 6-7 flyer. Uh, it also has one more creature that has a plus one plus one counter theme, uh, Council's Lieutenant. Uh, first Strike and Renown. So Renown is when it deals combat damage to a player, put a plus one, plus one counter on it. And when it attacks, if it is Renowned already, your other attacking creatures get plus one, plus one until the end of turn. So this is a really interesting direction to go and take this deck. Uh, it kind of is doing what I wanted to do with the Thalia's Lieutenant sub-theme, in, in that it's, it's more aggressive than previously. But I don't know that it's good, but I want to try it. I'll probably cut the Captain of the Watches for something else. Like, I know Captain of the Watch is the Nutter Butters with Preeminent Captain, but otherwise I don't really want a 6-mana card in my Legacy deck ever, unless it's named Terminus or X random stupid card in Nickfit. 
Um, and in the sideboard, I'll make some small changes. Um, I, I didn't end up liking Aegis of the Gods. Um, but this is neat. Uh, so Army of Thalia, we just finished the the matches with Red Prison, and we're going to move on to playing D&T. Uh, so we got a 4-1 finish with Red Prison, and now we'll go on and play some regular old D&T. Uh, so here's the deck list. I'm going to go ahead and leave this up for just a minute uh, before I hop into this stream so that I can take a second and refill my water. If you have any question, uh, questions, please throw those into the chat, and I'm going to start this league in about a minute. If you have any card changes you would like to suggest, feel free to throw those in as well. <laughs> If you were to build this, but you don't have a third recruiter for the sideboard, what would you replace it with? Um, if you don't have another recruiter, I would just play an anti-D&T card that has overlap elsewhere. So something like Sword of War and Peace would probably be a good slot in. Uh, because Recruiter of the Guard would be one of the cards that you're bringing in for matches like Miracles and, and the Mirror. And so having a card that goes in in the same sort of matchups would be important. Why the third Avenger over the third Revoker? Also third Path to Exile for Delver and Lens. Yeah, there's a lot of Merit Lodge floating around right now. Um, like, more Merit Lodge than I have seen probably in years. Because, like, now we have, like, both lands and turbo decks as as tier one or two decks, you know, kind of depending on, on how you define that and whose metrics you're using. Um, so just having more good answers to Merit Lodge is really important. And there's just so much Delver that, like, I really like to be able to board in five removal spells versus Delver. So versus Delver, I get Path, 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 Council's Judgment, Council's Judgment, and, and that's a pretty strong package to bring in. Uh, yes, I, I am an expert with d and That is, uh, that's not really debatable at this point. Um... Phil, when asked for any card suggestions, you should play Sword of War and Peace. That is that is correct. I love Sword of War and Peace. And any time that I uh, I think that that card is good, I will 100% play it. If I had a 16th sideboard card, it would probably be Sword of War and Peace. Um, I feel like this is a pretty balanced package. If I wanted to play Sword of War and Peace, I would cut like a Surgical Extraction and play Sword of War and Peace. But my package for the Mirror is pretty good with this build. Uh, like for the Mirror, I have like these four cards that are very good and some Path to Exiles that can fill the remaining slots. Uh, so I think that's okay. Um... I've been really hot on Leon and Relic Order recently, not necessarily because it's the best against the the tier one decks, like it's very good in the mirror, um, but because it's just been so powerful for me in all the random matchups that I'm facing. Like there are so many times where you'll play against something like Eldrazi or Tezzerator or Sneak in a show, where just having this card in your 75 really changes your matchup numbers, and I've been very happy with that. Uh, so Eric, Cataclysm is 
Oh, uh, Army Mythology, I see your question. I'll get to that one. Uh, Cataclysm is for big mana decks like Miracles, Checkpile, and the, the bigger Eldrazi that runs Cloudpost so that you can deny them mana uh, and like let the rest of your stuff do chip damage and kill them. It's also very good against Planeswalkers because Cataclysm gets rid of all of those. Uh, it doesn't let you keep those. Star Street, thank you very much for for uh, your resubscription. Yeah, you're one of my uh, my longest followers now. Uh, An army of Thalia, why no Prelate? I have not been too hot on Prelate recently because if you're playing against a bunch of check pile as the primary control deck, where they have removal at like one, two, three, um, it's hard to play that guessing game and win. All right. So that was white, white DNT. Let's get into a league. All right. Uh, okay. So why why no flagstones with two cataclysms in the sideboard? That's a really good question, and the answer is not obvious, right? So you would think that if I'm playing a bunch of cataclysms, then I really want to have flagstones and just like run four of these over two planes and two snow covered planes. But consider the metagame. Right now, Red Prison is a tier one deck that is everywhere. I would rather have two more planes in my deck for that matchup and for the Delver matchups so that I can't get wastelanded or like blood mooned out of a game. Um, that that's very important to me right now, and I value that much more than the incidental cataclysm value. That was a great question. Hey, Lingmeister, good news. I'm on DNT right now. Uh, we just went four one in the Red Prison League, and now I'm moving on to DNT. So. I got you. <laughs> so my opponent's on the Death Shadow Delver deck, and I just played them, and now I'm switching decks. This is great. Oh man, this is the get you got ya. No, I, I think Ensnaring Bridge is a very well-designed card, actually. I, I think it is a powerful card that has deck building and play restrictions built into it. I, I, I think that is a, a, a well-designed magic card. Probably not one that would be printed today, because it does promote some unfa unfair and unfun games of magic. Um, but, like, it is... I, I don't think a poorly designed magic card. Um, and, uh, Boko, um, on a critical turn, your opponent can wasteland a flagstones and deny you mana for that turn, and that can matter a lot. It doesn't seem like it should, but in those turns where it's like, man, I need to play a Mirren Crusader exactly this turn to wall that Gurmag Angler, and then they, they go and, like, it force you to not do that, it can be devastating. I'm going to play this Thalia off of Wasteland here, so that if the Thalia lives, I can hold Caracas up on the next turn and Wasteland their Watery Grave. Oh, Jotengrunt. Uh, Jotengrunt's days have probably passed. Um, not because it's bad as a main deck card, but because it's bad as a post-sideboard card. Ooh, buddy. Um, the, oh my god. 
Well, chat. I feel like I'm in trouble. So my line is Flicker Wisp, Flicker Caracas, block a Death Shadow, hope my opponent can't change their life total anymore, block with Athalia, bounce Thalia, redeploy Athalia, play a Batter Skull, hope I'm not dead by that point. Alright, I don't remember whether or not I got interrupted in the middle of my thought. Um, but Jotun Grunt is a fine main deck card, but because Rest in Peace is one of the best sideboard cards in the format, and you're very consistently bringing it in, uh, Jotun Grunt's ability to just be like a main deckable card is, is basically gone because of that. Yes, my, my opponent's deck is very much like the, the modern version of this deck, um, but you get to play with better cantrips and a few cards that uh, have gotten the axe in modern and soon will be getting the axe in legacy. Alright, so if I block both of these, I take 6 this turn, go to 14. I'll get drained to 12, then I'll block one of those and die. So I am going to need to draw another card to play or I die. That's unfortunate. God, do you have like another Death Shadow? Okay, okay. Still, still technically in this game, right? No, it does not run uh, Battle Rage in Legacy. It's usually a bug deck in Legacy. Um, no, Master, I have not tried Karn in DNT. I've played a lot of Karn in Red Prison, where I very much liked it. So now my opponent gets to attack in. I block 177, take 14. All right. So, like, let's say I get to play this Batter Skull. Alright, I would have died anyway. Uh, that, that would have been a very difficult game for me to win, basically, no matter what. Uh, so I was on the draw there, right? Death Rate Shaman? No, I was on the play. Alright, so play and loss. Game one, loss to triple death shadow. All right. Path is great here. Council's judgment is acceptable here. And rest in peace is worth considering, as it stops both Gurmag and Deathrite Shaman. I don't know that I'll actually board this in. This is in the maybe pile. Uh, these revokers are coming out. My recruiters are slow, but provide a chump blocking engine. So I will think twice about just sideboarding them out. Alright, night master. See you later. Uh, but maybe that's correct. If I if I go like recruiters out rest in peace out and don't try to fight on this axis, then I just have to trim one more card. Uh, 
I could trim like a flicker wisp. Oddly enough, I could also see myself trimming Sword of Fire and Ice. But I guess I'll leave it. I could also trim the 24th land, but I tend to like my extra lands versus Delver. And this hand's very good. It doesn't have any removal. But otherwise, it's sort of the ideal hand. Alright, opponent is at thir- sorry, opponent is at 11 already. Um, I don't know if my opponent is going to, like, greedily be jamming wastelands into their deck. Um, but there's some possibility of that. So I'm just going to play basic planes to guarantee that I can play my next card around a daze. My opponent does not have counter spells. They are they are just F6. Yeah, so that sort of thing happens a lot, right? Like, especially when you win games, if if you win a game quickly, you don't necessarily know what your opponent is on all the time. I, I've had a couple of like super, super awkward matches of that nature. And like in, in your example there, there's a very different way how you sideboard for Stoneblade versus Miracles. Alright, so based on what I know about my opponent's hand, I don't think they have any counter spells. Like they just F6 through my previous turn. So I think pre combat, I'm going to take some actions. That way, if my opponent wants to do something to interact with me, it's going to cause them to tap a Death Rite Shaman and my Thalia can safely get in without trading. Oh, thank you very much for your, for your subscription. I, I do appreciate your support. Um, let me thank you by name in a second here. So with this first one, I think this is just get batter skull. No. With my first one, I'm going to get Sword of Fire and Ice. And with my second, I'll get Batter Skull. Again, I don't think they have a counter spell. Which is why I'm going to take this slime. This allows me to leave my vial at two for a couple of turns and use my mana very efficiently. If my opponent wants to trade a Death Rite for a Thalia, I'm okay with that when I'm about to have an overwhelming board presence. So now with a land, I have lethal in the air. And if I miss on my land, then I just like play a batter skull and have lethal anyway the following turn. He 
the universe is telling you to play Stoneforge Mystic. Yeah, the card seems pretty good sometimes. A lily Last Hope. This should target the Flicker Wisp if my opponent is good. Opponent, while maybe not good, is at least decent. That's gonna be great. Just going to continue to pressure my opponent's life total here. Oh, so, uh, so, is it Yonk Robert? Don't know which, uh, which J that is supposed to be. Thank you very much for, uh, your resubscription. And MTG, uh, thank you very much for your auto hosts. I do appreciate that. I know you're probably not watching, but thank you anyway. There's a big fish. Yes. Okay, so I have a lot of choices this turn. I kind of just want to turn the Batter Skull into a 6-6 six, six crash in. If my opponent double blocks, I just like Flicker Wisp out the Deathrite Shaman and kill the Angler. And if my opponent just, like, chump blocks, then I take my Flicker Wisp and Flicker Wisp out the Liliana at my end step. I can lose a lot of tempo to a fatal push here. Yep, okay, that's fine. Um, actually, maybe I don't even... Maybe I don't even, like, deal with the Liliana. Maybe I just, like, let them use that on a Stoneforge. Don't care about it. Like, Flicker Wisp reset my Batter Skull on their second main phase. That's probably really good.
I don't really care if they like minus the lily. Berserk. Yum. That is that is something to be be aware of. It's it's not unprecedented, but not all of the lists have them. Yeah, okay. You can you can look at my hand, you can see the flicker wisp. I don't know. If he had the Berserk, he could double my Flicker Wisp and make it kill him real dead. There is the, the possibility of also double Berserking a creature, I suppose, and just, like, making it crazy big. Uh, so whoever mentioned the, the Double Strike red card earlier... Um, I forgot to mention this, but like you, you don't play that because you can just play Berserk, which is like way better. Yep, and that can just happen. So now I can present my opponent with three different lethal threats. I can equip a stone forge, swing in with that, swing in with a, a flicker wisp, swing in with a batter skull, and then still have mana to do things post combat. Oh shit, this was poor, wasn't it? If my opponent just like eats with a death right, or and eats with a second death right, they can actually go up to a higher life total. I might have just fucked up. I do, I do like the diversity. Like this, the line that I took, while probably not correct, probably forces my opponent into an unusual spot. So while I think it was probably a wrong play, I don't know how wrong it actually is. Oh, my opponent just doesn't have another green source. Okay, well, that... Oh, no, they do. No, they don't.
So my, my, my play, while initially a mistake, like, or at least I should have thought it through more, ends up working out very well for me. And my, my, I, my initial idea of diver uh, diversification ended up being very good since my opponent did actually have interaction for me. Um, so whoever said, like, to, to port the trop, I don't want to do that, because it's my intention to post-combat move the sword over to Flicker Wisp if I don't win this turn, so that it is protected from... Oh jeez, does opponent have, like, another removal spell? It'll push the Stoneforge. Okay. I'm I'm in for this plan. So my opponent is gonna let me hit them to one. But now I just get to do this. And this protects that from the lily. So I wonder if they were not thinking about that. And now I can wasteland them off of their green source. So that if they want to gain life, it requires death right tap and use second death right. Uh, the deck list below the stream is probably not accurate. Um, after this game, I'll I'll give you the opportunity to take a screenshot if you want. I think I have my red prison deck list below the stream. There's some possibility that I'm not actually supposed to wasteland this trop because there's no lands in the graveyard for death rites to eat, so it's actually like denying mana. And if I don't wasteland, then I can equip Stoneforge with Batter Skull on my next turn. Liliana will shrink it a little bit. So it would be a three power attacker. So okay, okay, so that's not relevant. So I guess I do wasteland. This ended up being a surprisingly complicated turn. Um So I don't really mind a Berserk, right? I can take 10... Okay, I guess I guess I can't beat a Berserk. Yes, I can. If they, if they Berserk, it hits me for 10, then they have to, like, use a Death Rite in order to do that. So I can, I can beat Berserk. because then they can't double drain me. Ooh, spicy. Gain the life to try to draw an extra card. I respect that line a lot. Liliana the Last Hope is such a good magic card. Holy shit. Like, my, my opponent was nowhere in that game until that hit the battlefield. Uh, it, it did a lot of work. I... I'm still thinking back to that turn where I equipped that Stone Forge. And I wonder if I had thought that through a little bit more, whether that was the line I still would have taken. The more I think about it, the more I think it is the line I would have taken. So I don't necessarily think it was a mistake, um, but I wish I had thought about that for another half a second. Uh, 
I'm really tempted to bring in rest in peace. I, my opponent is like very reliant on the graveyard. Like even Liliana the Last Hope cares about the graveyard in some capacity. But most of my cards are just good. But I might be over sideboarding to bring those in. Like, as is, I'm sitting at 20 creatures and I don't really want to cut to any lower than that number. So if I was going to cut anything, it'd be like Sword of Fire and Ice. And the upside of one Sword of Fire and Ice is probably better than one War and Peace. I don't know around this back. Um, again, I don't have that many reps versus this match, so I can't say with 100% certainty that what I'm doing is right. Uh, this is a very tempting one land hand to keep, because if I spike a land, this becomes very powerful. I get two draw steps to hit a land. I have Mom for an Angler or a Shadow. I have Path to Exile as well for a first threat. And if I hit that second land, then like Stoneforge fetches Jitte, and I have three pieces of equipment I can dump in and try to win the game with. This is very, very close to a keep. So this is so good with a land. It's not as good as like an Aether Vial hand would be, but like I have two answers to opposing cards that matter, plus a proactive threat and an answer to something that slips through. I'm going to keep this one. This is very, very, very close to a mulligan. I'm running 24 lands, which makes me slightly more willing to keep this hand. So, like, I have 23 out of 53 hits, and I get two chances to hit. And if I miss for one or two turns, I can still probably get back into this game. So, like, I think I'm okay with those odds. Like, if I, like, let's just pretend this Batter Skull isn't here. As a six card hand, this would be a phenomenal six card hand. But whether or not, like, this is better than, like, the six with the random scry we get, that's, that's hard to say. Thought sees me. All right, you're you're at seven life, opponent. You do you. Okay, so the the strongest portions of my hand have now disappeared. Uh, my opponent had two answers on turn one. So this is going to be a Gurmag Angler. I can beat this with a land very easily. Yeah, there we go. My opponent has like another daze. That's uh, bad. So now I need my opponent to, like, not have a dismember. But if they dismember, they can't fetch anymore. Alright. Well, okay, I guess that's not true, because they could pay mana. 
and go like dismember plus two life. So now I need my opponent to not hit fatal push. And in addition to that, I have a Council's Judgment in hand that can deal with Gurmag Angler. Or, if that doesn't resolve, uh, then like Thalia and Balance Gurmag Angler can buy me some time. Alright. Alright, opponent is out of counter spells. My opponent's ponder probably looks for like a force of will at this point in order to protect their zombie fish. Alright. Death right, shaman's okay. What do my opponent do with their ponder? They did not shuffle. Uh, it is turn four. What do I want to do? I think I want to play Avenger now, so that Avenger can attack on my next turn. That'll put my opponent to one. And they currently cannot gain life, so I'm currently winning the race. I'll tick Vile up to two, put in Athalia, Chump Block, Gurmag Angler. Um, opponent is now dead on board unless they use their Deathrite Shaman to gain life or answer Sarah Avenger. Fatal push. Rough. So now I'm hoping to top deck a land so that I can get rid of Gurmag Just like I wrote it up. Damn it. This is so annoying. My opponent goes lol, why not first? Oh my god, another Fatal Push? Okay, that's fine. Uh, so my opponent had a very strong tempo hand. Like, I thought there was a Thought Seize. Okay, yeah, it was. So my opponent had Double Daze and Thought Seize and Triple Fatal Push. Um, so I think our keep was correct. Um, but this would have been a very hard hand to beat for, for almost all of my draws. Um, like, that, that degree of disrupt disruption is very difficult to beat. Alright, so game three, loss to Tempo. Do you think killing Shaman is better if it resolved? What was my life total? Six? So I get three turns. So I'd have Athalia, then I'd go Jitte, 
and then I just take connect. I'm not sure if that's actually true. Like if I if I just like keep Thalia bouncing the Gurmag Angler, that takes up a bunch of my resources every turn. And I th think I got that race via Jete. Not not sure. Ooh, it looks like my opponent has been playing like things like four color loam and maverick. So this will be uh, an interesting matchup. I'm gonna go ahead and keep my hand. It's it's a little bit soft to wasteland, which I don't like. Now it's less soft to wasteland. Um. I can just like. Wasteland this Tranquil Thicket and see if I can just like mize my opponent. But if they're a Loam deck and that doesn't work out, it's probably very bad for me. So I think I'm just going to play Planes and Pass and hope that they're on a Maverick deck that just happens to have Tranquil Thicket rather than lands. Okay, so this is lands that has moved the Ancient Tomb to the main deck. Uh, the Ancient Tomb in the sideboard is pretty stock. So my opponent has Loam and Thicket. Uh, that's bad for me. So what is, what is my path to victory? My path to victory is not like wastelanding them out of this game. It's probably getting a sword and making something like Mirror and Crusader Pro red. Since they crop rotation for Grove, that might mean they already have the Punishing Fire, in which case if I play Thalia and they don't have another untapped green source, they cannot both Punishing Fire and Grove. So I should probably do that. This has the upside of if it works, I will get to protect Thalia with Caracas as well. Never mind, opposing Caracas, GG. Again, valuing the idea that a pro red sword is probably how I am going to win this, I'm going to go ahead and tutor that up right now. Uh, yes, Batter Skull is a possible option, but Batter Skull can be double punishing fired, which is something that I have to respect, whereas if I equip a sword to something, then like it's just not dying to punishing fire.
how short-sighted do I want to be? If I want to be super short-sighted, I can try to just, like, knock this grove off the table for a turn or two. But I don't think I want to do that. I think I want to play... Just, like, play sword this turn. The next turn go, like, Avenger and Equip. Leaving up this wasteland means that I can stop a combo attempt is what I was about to finish saying. Uh, Adventure and Thalia is not good, right? Like, ooh, that's very good. If I play Thalia, it just gets bounced by Caracas. If I play Avenger, they'll bounce this with Caracas and then go, like, Punishing Fire, return Punishing Fire, play a red source, Punishing Fire, Avenger, and then I have nothing. Right, I, I know it won't die to one fire, but it'll die to two. And since my opponent returned, or was going to return the grove at my end of turn, that meant for their turn, they would have two up. Like, assuming they could play red source, um, which I know they could do based on their loaming. Alright, so now I can go like Avenger, put sword on it, unfortunately like this bomb's good but not that good because my opponent can just Punishing Fire it away and still produce a Merit Lodge if they want. So my opponent like can loan back Dark Depths. What if I go Crusader Equip? If I go Crusader Equip, that's 4, 8, 9, 10, that's 12 damage and this Ancient Tomb can't be tapped then. So that actually might be better. It'll expose my Caracas. Whereas if I play the Avenger, I can sandbag the Caracas and hope that they just make a Merit Lodge. But Crusader can attack through Merit Lodge, and that's relevant because I'm at 24. Yeah, uh, Crusader seems correct to me. This game's really interesting. I really enjoy the matchups versus lands. Yes, maze would be pretty devastating. Uh, but I can't I can't beat a maze if my opponent also, like, ghost quarters my wasteland. Which is something that, like, probably should happen. What's well, all this mana? Top deck shall I? Not in this list, unfortunately. Fuck! A 
Oh wait, no, opponent messed up and didn't play Ghost Quarter? Did opponent mess up again? And by tapping the Ancient Tomb to make my, my attack lethal? Like now I just Wasteland Maze of Ith, right? Yeah, they they just threw this one. Unless they have crop rotation. In which case I need to play Thalia first. Alright. Alright, it's it's fine. I got this. So I play this Thalia, and then crop rotation cannot get them out of this, and they are dead. Woo! <laughs> God, I love magic. This game is so good. Ah, okay, so my opponent in, in the chat type, typed, did the double strike math wrong, dot, 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 forgot you got two triggers. <coughs> Alright, my, my opponent says this is their first time playing the deck. Alright, chat, remind me to message my opponent when this is done and tell them that I'm streaming. I don't want to tell them yet. Like, I don't I don't think they'll uh they'll like ghost me or anything. Um, but I just want to let them know when when we're done that there's gonna be a video. Alright. So surgical and path and rest and peace are pretty good. And then we have some other things that we can consider. I usually board Revoker out in this matchup until my opponent shows me a Molten Vortex. That's my starting point. I usually board Crusader out, despite the fact that Crusader did nutty things there, it just dies to a Punishing Fire. It'll go down some number of sorts to plowshares. Like, I still want some removal for Merit Lodge and Tireless Tracker, but I don't need to go overboard. It's really easy to overboard. Yeah, and, and that's the great thing about Legacy, right? Like, you get a lot of time to to go and learn your decks, and there is a lot to be learned. Um, so I've played a little bit of lands. Um, I played it in a couple of legacy leagues on paper, um, where I was organizing some tournaments for cash in town. Uh, this is this is a fine opener. It's not insane or anything, but it has a lot of good tools to, to work with. Um, so I've played lands a little bit. Um, I am I am no master, but I can probably give acceptable commentary on a lands match. That's kind of like where I stand. I, I know a lot of the intricate lines, um, but I don't have experience playing the deck against good players. 
Like, I've, I've played lands against a bunch of, of okay players, just like a bunch of the locals in town, and, and it went fine. Um, but I would not be comfortable picking up lands and bringing it to a tournament. It's so hard. Lines are so intricate, and you need to play quickly. And that's hard to do. Yeah, and, then, and and here my opponent realizes immediately, and they go, uh, maybe ghost quartering myself was the right play. So... This is probably just a Thalia and pass turn. It doesn't do a ton, but I don't, like, I know my opponent has two lands in hand because of the life from the loam, so, like, wastelanding them doesn't really do anything, and if they want to loam again, then that requires... Okay, so here my opponent is thinking that they can Punishing Fire this Thalia, but that's not going to happen. Oh, maybe they didn't think that. I, I thought for sure they were going to start tapping their mana. <laughs> my opponent likes my planes. Alright, um, so if I recruiter, what am I recruitering for? Stoneforge? Get a piece of equipment? Probably. Yeah, that seems right. I do not have a prelate in my seventy five. Prelate is... Awesome for the lands matchup in particular. But generally speaking, I do not love it in the metagame right now. Oh, shit, what did I do? Oh, that was really bad. Oh, I, I clicked... I clicked yes for that, but it went into the chat box, not into the game itself. That's frustrating. Something something, moto, quality program, something something. Oh, that was a wasteland, not a ghost quarter. Sorry, I thought I got ghost quartered. I'm, I'm chatting with my opponent, like, telling some of the 
the things that are going on with my, my deck and whatnot. Uh, so I'm, I'm more distracted than usual. So I, I thought I clicked no for a ghost quarter. Yeah, never mind. I'm good. Sorry if that seemed like totally unintelligible chat. I'm debating whether or not I want to, like, play this Mother of Runes currently. I think I just want to, like, play Wasteland Pass, use Plains Plains to activate and put in my sword, and then hold the Wasteland up so I can't be Wastelanded again. I think that's better because that would also potentially allow me to hold up a path to path one of my own creatures if it gets punishing fired. This gives me greater flexibility in what I do with my turn. So this is where I'll go and put in the sword, and I'll do this with Plains Plains. And my opponent will wait to Punishing Fire until I go for an equip. So do I have any reason to Thalia? No. In fact, I don't think I want to. So I think I'm going to equip Recruiter. I'll go to attack in with both. And I, and I can't stop this by like Violin and Thalia right here. So I can now use a Path to Exile as a ramp spell. I, I have triple removal spell. I'm not too worried about that right now. Uh, I don't think my opponent has any reason to wasteland me right there yet. I think, in fact, that's going to be a costly mistake, because now I'm going to put in Thalia. So now, so that I don't connect with the sword again, my opponent is going to have to just, like, play a land and pass. Never mind. That's a very good draw. That is also a very good draw. So now I go for no equip, I attack with both of these, Thalia gets bounced, Stoneforge gets punishing fired. And then I'll put in Sarah Avenger and equip Sword, along with probably playing out my mom to just like keep my opponent's mana tied up. 
Um, I guess that's fine. But, like, this now gives me the opportunity to just equip the stone forge with the sword, too. So I think that's... That's a misplay on my opponent's end. But maybe they just don't want me to, like, keep filing the Thalia back in. I, I think I still just go Avenger Sword, play Mom, and get super aggressive. Let, th let them take that Stoneforge Mystic. And just like create a big body that's never going to die to like double punishing fire. Uh, so so remember my my opponent has been chatting with me. They they are new to lands. Maze of Ith. That's pretty good. I'll uh, leave that on two until I have a reason to tick up to three. Uh, this is a fine draw. This this lets me start to be cheeky. So I can equip this to Stoneforge here and attack him with both of these to deal more damage. It'll maze my Stoneforge. And then I'll still crack for three. Um, opponent currently cannot double fire Avenger. So I'll just sit as is. Alright. Merit Lodge is being threatened. gonna do this see if they react they do This gives them a land, but I don't want to give them 20 life here. I am A-OK -okay with Wastelanding this Maze of Ith to draw another card. It also pushes a lot of damage. <laughs> My opponent says, that was a good Wasteland. I do not disagree. I can't really do anything with that batter skull yet. Alright, so opponent has Punishing Fire in hand now. So that means they can go Punishing Fire Avenger, play land, Punishing Fire Avenger, and get rid of it. So that means I do want to move the sword this turn. Or is that true? If they go two mana loam, yeah, 
Okay, I fucked this up. I was supposed to leave that. Because if they go Loam for Maze and already have Punishing Fire in hand and played Mox Diamond, that exact line punishes me. So this, this is this is fine. Okay. I'm, I'm gonna take one one turn, one extra turn here to kill them. Well, no, the 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 clock's the same. Sorry, ex ex excuse me. That's that's not accurate. My opponent could have been at a slightly lower life total, but overall results is the same. Oh yes, it is, it is considerably harder without a prelate, un unquestionably. Um, Pontiff is a great card in this deck, but it is exceptionally difficult to cast with most of the mana bases that people are trying to put it in. Yes, again, no one is going to argue that, like, Prelate is bad in this matchup. Having Prelate is very important to this matchup, but I don't think the card is generally great in the metagame right now. Alright, so if, if my opponent can live another turn, then they can Thespian stage their Maze of If to survive. So, my opponent will go Punishing Fire, Germ, Rebuy Punishing Fire, Punishing Fire, Germ, Maze of Ith Avenger, and then not be able to copy their maze. Fearing a Croson Grip, opening up my Avenger just dying. I'm going to go ahead and do this, even though it doesn't accomplish a lot. And I'm going to start F6-ing through my opponent's turns in case they, like, stabilize and turn the corner here. I've got very much lethal as soon as my opponent... Well, sorry. As soon as I draw something like a Wasteland or a Port... I'll have Lethal or a Flicker Wisp. And drawing something like a Rest in Peace will also shut my opponent out of this game.
Yes, my, my opponent copying a maze of if would be very bad for me. Alright, waste, waste, stage, coming back. Uh, I don't need to take that up yet. That is sort of an unfortunate draw. Seen the line. This is game two, right? I won game one. I just didn't record it in my spreadsheet. So this actually isn't that bad for me. This gives me the opportunity to take a hit for 20, find a port or a flicker wisp or a maze of if, and win the game. Yes, it's for predict. It just passes. I respect that play a lot. So I just have to like pass back here. I, I can like Swords of Merit Lodge give my opponent 20, but that gets me nowhere. So now I just like pass. Hope my opponent doesn't see the line of copy their Maze of If. Oh, shit. I'm going to try to draw another Flicker Wisp next turn, chat. That's the current plan. The body's irrelevant. The, the, the body of the germ token is irrelevant. I'm more scared of a Trosen grip, getting rid of my sword, and then losing the game in that capacity. Backup Merit Lodge is rough. I don't think I can beat that. 
So this is, yeah, this is where my opponent attacks in. And I'll 100% just take this 20 here. I should probably concede this for clock, actually. I, I can't really get through this. I have to Swords of Merit Lodge here that puts my opponent to 28. They can just keep doing this forever. I'm going to take a minute to update my spreadsheet. I spent a lot of time talking to my opponent, which I probably shouldn't have done. Uh, so Chad, at this point I'm going to ignore you a little bit and kind of just like play this game out since I need to play it quickly. Uh, this is not a good hand. This is a weak but acceptable hand. Uh, I'll just bottom that. No, I don't really like Cataclysm in the lands matchup anymore. They just rebuild so quickly that unless you have a rest in peace as well, it's just not worth it. Oh geez, double Mox Diamond opener. If they have a Loam as well, uh, this is probably unbeatable. Alright. Annoyingly, I'm not going to be able to f6 through my turns since my through my opponent's turns since they have. Uh, since like I have to hold up my mom activations. We'll shut off this upkeep. Stop though. Not oh, great. Drop of honey. Can I pr mom protect this? Destroy the creature with the least power. It can't be regenerated to an organization. I don't really have time to think about it. I'll try to protect mom, and if it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. Yeah, I don't, I don't think this works, but there's like literal no downside of me doing it. Yeah, so now, now I have to just let my Thalia die, unfortunately. And like this whole like thicket, like from the loan, loan thing is, is just going to drown me. I need to find a rest in peace like now. All right. If 
my opponent just plays a stage and produces a Merit Lodge, I can beat that as is. If I were my opponent, I would copy Rashad and Port in response. Yeah, there we go. Good play. I'm going to keep two ways to destroy a Merit Lodge in hand. Uh, since, my, since I have this rest in peace here, I can kind of mess with my opponent. Like, they get one, one good shot here. Yep, that's a good line. That ghost quarter's really good. My opponent is 100% going to go for like tap my Caracas and then produce a 2020. So I need to do something proactively to try and like survive another turn. And that is play Flicker with so that I can block. Oh my god, I'm getting another turn. Holy shit. Oh yeah, fuck this when I'm low on time.
What is it, F2 that's pass until response? Should have ported my opponent, but whatever. Punishing fire at this point. Clock. God, is there a second maze? A dark depths. Alright, that's pretty solid. So if if I played that match out like like normally at a more reasonable pace, um, it's possible, but still probably pretty unlikely that I was going to win that. Like the my opponent made made some errors that let me get further ahead in that one than I needed to. But even if I had like another you know, two or three minutes on the clock from, you know, playing more focused and interacting with the chat less. I still don't know that I could have closed out that game in time before my opponent found the win. Ugh. That was a beating. That was very, very interesting magic. Uh, there was a lot of decision points in that match. That round was maybe winnable. This this might be one where I go back and watch the replay.
Oh yeah. Okay, great. I'm I'm glad I'm glad you found me so quickly. So, um, I will have a lot of useful commentary for you. I, I pointed out a lot of spots, um, especially in game one, where I think you could have played better. Uh, like in, in that turn where I won, like you you doing the double strike math wrong was bad. Um, but I think there was like two or three things that actually happened in that turn cycle that really allowed me to do well. Because, like, it was you tapping the Ancient Tomb that turned the Crusader into a one-turn clock. So when you were thinking that, like, you would have stayed in two, it was probably because you weren't counting your Ancient Tomb activation in your life total. And uh, there was something else I don't remember off the top of my head. Um, but it'll, it'll be worth your time to watch that match for some commentary. Uh, this hand looks solid. Uh, so I'll go ahead and keep this. Like, it's not exciting, but I have two lands and five two-drops. That seems okay. Uh, yes, Honk, absolutely. That's, uh, that's something that I would be willing to do. Um, that's not something that I've done previously, but I know other streamers do that. Um, so, like, if, if you paid me to do a critique of some of your matches, you know, I'd go and I'd look at, you know, your, your matches, I'd comment on your, your sideboarding, some of your lines, give you, like, timestamps and stuff like that. Um, so that's, that's absolutely something that I'm really willing to do. Uh, if you're interested in something like that, email me. Ooh, Grim Lavamancer. So if I play a Thalia, my opponent can't both play something to put a second card into Graveyard and eat it. So in order to kill the Thalia, they would need to... they need to have a fetch land. Them having a fetch land is somewhat likely. Would they have fetch landed on turn one if they had it? Maybe. If I just play Stoneforge, my opponent can, like, cantrip and then eat it. So I will go for this Thalia line. Uh, if they don't have a fetch land, uh, this works out very well for me. Okay. W Wasteland also falls into that category. You know, same same thing. It, it puts a, a land into the graveyard at, at no cost to them. Like a master. So now I'm going to put them in the same situation that they were in last turn. Actually worse, because like now this Thalia lives. The Thalia will tax them for their turn. I'll, I'll crack back for two, and then I'll play a Stoneforge, and then another Stoneforge, and then another Stoneforge. And then another stone forge, and then they'll be dead. Hopefully. Oh, not blue red delver. Actually, Grixis delver. Uh, and this is just their. Oh wow, this is this is a strong opener. Holy cow, chat. So if I attack in with Thalia, will my opponent double block in any way? Probably not. Their cards are all very good. So I don't... I'm going to play the, the Stoneforge pre-combat, like, just in case I'm wrong. And I'm going to get Batter Skull with the first to really incentivize my opponent to kill the Stoneforge not knowing that I have two more to deploy. Uh, Woody, we're, we're doing well tonight. Uh, we went 4-1 with Red Prison. Uh, we're currently 0-2 with DNT. Uh, both matches have been exceptionally close, and we've ended up on the wrong side of them.
Uh, we lost to a very nutty Death Shadow Delver draw that included triple um, Death Shadow, and then we we essentially timed out versus lands. Uh, they 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 technically killed me, um, but it was, it was very close to a timeout. Did they probe? Oh, they probed. Yep. So this this is one of those things. This is one of those mistakes that you make, and like where you're streaming that you'd never make in real life, or when you're like playing on your own. So sorry about that. Um, so Merja. If, if you're used to playing mud and, and stacks and pox and things of that nature, um, a, a lot of the difference there is that your, your hate cards are your hate cards and your win conditions are your win conditions, and those don't tend to overlap very much, whereas in this deck instead you have your hate cards stapled to your win conditions, and so that's, that's a big conceptual difference. This main deck, Lavamancer, is tearing me a new one. So we're going to play the Stoneforge Mystic first so that I can play that around a daze. And then I'll play the Mom into daze. Uh, it is still very possible that my opponent's board will just aggro me out. Uh, so Andre, we we started the stream off with Red Prison and went 4-1, and now we're 0-2 on DNT. This is rough. Uh, so now my opponent gets to hit me for 6, and I just have to take that, and the Grim Lava Mancer activation kill my Stoneforge Mystic. Uh, this this is like very much a perfect draw on their end, and now I'll play my Stoneforge. I'm gonna get crack. Oh, maybe not now. Okay, so if I play my Stoneforge, I get cracked for six in the air, two with Deathrite Shaman, and then I'm dead on the following turn. What if I play this Avenger? If I play this Avenger, my opponent has a Lightning Bolt. So if I if I block, I can trade with an Avenger. But if I go to protect, then I lose the Avenger. That's unfortunate, so I'll just take... I'll trade Avenger straight up for a Delver, take three. And then I kind of have to hope that my opponent is out of gas. Just taking three from the Delver would mean... And I'm on a longer clock. There's no instants or sorceries in my opponent's graveyard, but they do have a lightning bolt. The life gain from the Stoneforge Mystic isn't fast enough as is. So I think I have to play Avenger, hope my opponent has, like, Stone Cold, literal nothing. Try to draw into, like, a removal spell or something for the other Delver, and then, like, somehow not die to those other cards? Uh this is no bueno. And I also probably need to hold the Thalia back so that my opponent can't just like attack in with these idiots. Oh, do I have force days? Alright. Alright. 
So now it's just 6, 12 in the air. And that puts something in the graveyard for death right to eat. Okay. This is the point where I believe that I am dead. However, I'm going to play out another turn or so here and just see if they show me another card. Uh, I will definitely board in Rest in Peace against this opponent, even though I'm not currently doing that against normal builds. Uh, this Grim Lava Mancer is devastating. The fact that my opponent had that, like, turn one, just, like, cold invalidated my hand. So, six in the air. Seven, eight, nine, ten, twelve. So it doesn't matter whether or not I block this, this is just, like, six... 9, 10, okay, so this, this block doesn't matter. Uh, I'm super dead. Uh... Yeah. So that's just like Grim Lava Mancer and Bolt to finish things off. Uh, which it would have happened if I was at 5 or 6. Uh, so, so Mr. Rocket, the, the choice at the time I made in case my opponent played something like a Young Pyromancer, um, like in, in the state of that game, it was largely irrelevant since I got Wastelanded off my mana. So I was on the player draw for that on the play. Loss to Puto Momo. Game one loss to Grim Lavamancer. So I'll probably go rip, path, 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 consider council's judgment, but probably don't board it in. And I'll go, like, Revokers out, I'll probably go Recruiters out, and board out one Flicker Wisp, and then run this. Normally I board in Council's Judgment over Rest in Peace, but if my opponent is going to be playing Deathrite Shaman and Grim Lava Mancer, uh, then this is probably correct. I like having the Council's Judgment as something that can answer True Name Nemesis, but I don't, I don't really like to drop below 20 creatures, if at all possible, just because, like... At that point, you're not as strong of an Aether Vial deck. In order to board these in, I board out four creatures, so like you, you have to make the sacrifices somewhere. Uh, Pillow Fort Cataclysm comes in for matchups like Check Pile and Miracles and Big Eldrazi. Uh, this is. Not an overly exciting hand, but this is fine. Oh, there was another question there. Um, so, so Andre, we, we were a little bit unlucky. Um, not overly so in any capacity. Like the, uh, that's a good draw. That means that, like one of these can eat a daze or a force. The the Death Shadow Delver player definitely drew well against us. I'm gonna make my opponent like kill the Stone Forge since I have a second. Yes, I, I am aware that like Council Judgment is good for like their their one of Liliana that they usually have in the sideboard, um, but I can't afford to board in both Rip and Council Judgment. I don't think so. I, I need to make an active choice there.
going to be hard to use my mana efficiently this turn and still play around things. I think I'm going to like try to choke my opponent on mana here. So I attempt to path to exile this Death Ray Shaman and pray to God that he's not playing Bob Wong's Island in the sideboard. I'm so terrified for Grixis Delver players to like actually adopt that island. It's it's so good. And now I have to make a choice about whether or not I want to like take out this underground sea and and try to continue my plan of choking them on mana, or whether I want to like try to get ahead on tempo and play this Stoneforge Mystic. I don't like that I'm not using my mana efficiently if I play this the Wasteland on the Underground Sea. But the tempo loss of just like waste this is pretty bad if my opponent just like flops down a Delver or something like that. So I probably should just play the Stoneforge. If they daze whatever, it sets them back a mana. If they force, I'm okay with that exchange. Uh, but that's a, that's a close decision point. This also makes them use their turn to deal with the Stoneforge Mystic, which I'm all about. Yeah, Bob's playing an island in the sideboard for the Death and Taxes matchup for Path to Exile and for Red Prison. Uh, it's... It's a very big deal breaker in terms of win percentage for both of those matchups. I'm not a Grixis Delver player, but in my personal opinion, it feels wrong to not play that island. Like, with Red Prison being a clear tier 1 deck and Death and Taxes as well, you get huge upside. Uh. You get huge upside for playing that island. A kingdom for a rest in peace. I think this is probably a turn where I just like double wasteland my opponent and put in a batter skull. And I'll probably put it in on my main phase to play around like some stifle shenanigans. It's, it's either, like, Batterskull and Jitte this turn, or just Batterskull Double Waste. I think Batterskull Double Waste is better. Like, it's going to constrict my opponent's resources so, so hard and really make them have to have something like land and a braid in order to get out of this spot. Yeah, they can make red with Deathrite Shaman all they want. That does not beat a batter skull. So, in all likelihood, their turn is now, like, use Deathrite Shaman to produce mana, use Grim Lava Mancer to kill Stoneforge so they only have one piece of equipment instead of multiple that they have to deal with. Ooh, no, it's a cantrip. This is a super bad situation if they whip on a land. Preferably, it needs to be a fetch land, too.
Ooh. We're done here. We're done here. My opponent is brainstorm locked, and I have a batter skull, and I'm about to crap in a second piece of equipment. Again, on the off chance that my opponent is playing stifle, I'm just going to do this now. Uh, Army of Thalia, stifle. Uh, my opponent probably doesn't have it. But probably doesn't and absolutely don't are, are two different things. Yes, honk. Like, my opponent 100% brainstorms there. Yes, like, absolutely no question they need to brainstorm. Uh, however, if they whip, it's, it's very, very bad. It's a game to win with equipment. Chat, keep your mole. What do you think? I'll let you think about this for like 30 seconds and then I'll answer. But I just want to see what people uh, think of this hand. Some Delver builds run Stifle, not all of them. Most people in the chat are saying keep. Essentially, it's a five card hand. You're right. Keep. If this vial resolves, this hand is insane. And I think the upside of vial resolving is strong enough that I am willing to take that chance. This is the sort of hand where it is hyper-aggressive while also being defensive. Like, this is going to brick wall, um, like, like Delvers and Young Pyromancers and such, and even something like a Grim Lava Mancer isn't overly good against this hand. So if this resolves, you know, we're, we're a strong favorite. You know, it can still get, like, Ancient Grudged or something like that, so, like, it's, it's not 100% victory or anything like that by any means. Uh, but this is this is a very strong hand. To quote Disney's Hercules, if if is good. Rest in peace off the top, huh? Huh? Source the plowshares. I will source the plowshares, death right shaman. Will I do it right now? No, I think I wait. It can be spell pierced right now. But if I wait and my opponent like drains with the death right shaman that I target and then like fetches, they can use it for mana, so I don't actually want that. So if I get a Source of Flowshares out right now and that helps my Jitte, or sorry, if I get a Spell Pierce out now and that helps my Jitte resolve later, I'm okay with that. No, Mr. Rocket, I think Revoker is uh, very weak in this matchup. Like, when, when Grim Lava Mancer isn't in the deck, it's very poor. With Grim Lava Mancer in there, um, I don't really know that it's better than a Rest in Peace. Like, the Revoker can die and then unlock the Deathrite Shaman and 
Grid Lava Mancer, whereas the rest in peace is going to just like shut those cards off forever. Rob, which thing specifically are you judging me for? I've done I've done plenty of shady things recently, so so which which one in particular? Was it the Disney's Hercules quote? I feel like it was that. Uh, so, so Rob, I actually have a lesson plan built around Disney's Hercules, where I have the kids talk about the movie as a way to talk about, like, modernization and retelling of myths, and I have them, like, point out all of the things that are wrong about the movie in comparison to, like, the ancient versions of the tales. Ooh, you want a creature with a tiny suppression field on it. That sounds fun. Not for this deck. Like, suppression field is one of the best cards against us, so so that doesn't really- ah, fuck. Doesn't quite do what I want. But a soldier, say, that had a tiny suppression field on it, that would be pretty hot for other reasons. I would enjoy that. <laughs> Army of Thalia. Isn't Hercules fairly accurate for a Disney movie, that is? Do you want to start a Phil rant? Because that's how we start a Phil rant. Uh, I'm gonna leave this there for now. Yes, the, the the story is is notably worse in in the Disney version than than in the original. I I agree. Um, there's a lot of there's a lot a lot a lot of details censored in order to make it kid friendly, um, that make the plot very questionable. Planes. Lanes. I will take that. At what point does Watsi's creature power creep obsession end up evapping? Ah! Fuck that card. Planes. Not planes. But a step in the right direction. So with a land, uh, my life is great. Again, like, planes is such an insane draw. It's acceptable.
Come on. That's your third wasteland. Planes. Fuck me. So planes, planes, still a great draw. Just, just gonna throw that out there. I can probably beat a Liliana emblem. If I go like Crusader, Jitte, Equip, and just two turn them. I win that race. Planes. Planes deck. I don't ask for much. God damn it. This is probably my last turn where I have like any hope of winning the game if I draw a planes. Nope. Alright. Alright, so now we take two here, go to seven, take four, five, six. Alright. So a lot of things had to go wrong for us in order to lose that one. So we kept an, an amazing one land Aether Vile hand. We, we got to use it and then it got Pithing Needled. That was fine. The three wastelands taking us off of three non-basic lands, that was rough. If at any point in that game one of the colorless lands that I drew, either Wasteland or Port, or the second port, was a colored source, I would get to deploy either the Avenger or the Crusader, either of which would have picked up Jitte and taken over that game. So that one did not work out, but that one, that one was being on the wrong side of variance on a number of different levels. Uh, you know, deck deck did not deliver there. Um, so Andre, I don't know how much of it you were around for. Um, but I, what I was talking about was not wanting to bring my creature count too low. So, like, my starting creature point for this deck is 25 instead of the normal 26, since I'm playing one extra land. And I don't really want to ever go down below 20 creatures if I can avoid it. That's kind of a number that I'm pretty comfortable with in terms of, like, having enough threats to actually win the game. So I only want to sideboard five cards uh, against Grixis Delver, if that's the case. And since my opponent was playing those Lava Mancers... Um, I wanted rest in peace over Council's Judgment, accepting the fact that something like a True Name or a Liliana might be slightly harder to beat in return for shutting off more of their cards with rest in peace. Uh, but generically against Grixis Delver, um, I board these five cards instead. Alright, give me one moment to update some things here.
Okay, sorry about that. Oh, hello, hello, Chip It Hot Sauce. Welcome. We just got skunked pretty hard uh, by an unfortunate series of draws uh, from a Grixis Delver opponent. And so, so tonight was two two wins with Red Prison and then three losses with DNT. And like, so 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 be it. Uh, you know that that happens sometimes. Um, Deck list was fine. I definitely liked having the extra Sarah Avengers. Um, I was very happy to see those cards in those matches versus Delver. Um, you know, if my opening hand had had Crusaders rather than Avengers, it would not have been a keep. That would have been a pretty easy mulligan. Uh, so I feel like this deck list was pretty good, and it just didn't work out for us tonight, and and that's fine. Um, so did I hit my follower threshold yet? I'm going to refresh my page, chat. I'll lose anything you say for about the next five seconds. I did hit my follower threshold. So now that I'm above 800 viewers, I owe you all an ancient tomb stream of some nature. And this is what I'm thinking about. Chat, tell me tell me what your thoughts are on this deck list. I know I said it was going to be an ancient tomb D&T deck, but this is something I've wanted to play for a while. Uh, replace the untamed, unclaimed territory with like one of the pain lands. Um, I thought this was going to be a good idea, and then I changed my mind. So this is um, a deck that I called the Hateful Eight um, because it played eight Thalias, and I thought that was a cute name. And I played this a while back, prior to the printing of Palace Jailer, and I splashed red when I did it for Flame Tongue Kabu as removal. But now that Palace Jailer is out, that just seems better at fulfilling that same role. And Wingmare has also been printed since then. So I thought it would be fun to just go, like, maximum taxation and really get people. And if the hate bears don't work, the Eldrazi go and get people dead instead. Um, I think this would be a lot of fun. Um, at first I wanted to play Unclaimed Territory because I thought I was mostly going to have humans, but then once I put the wing mares in there, um, that didn't work anymore. And there's also white sideboard cards that are non-creatures that I would need to cast with it. Uh, so these would be replaced with pain lands. Um, but otherwise, I like most of what's going on here. Yeah, so Displacer and Jailer is disgusting. Displacer and Thought Not Seer is pretty gross as well. But even something as simple as, like, Displacer, tap down your guy, get in for five with my pair of Thalias or something like that is still pretty good. So, um, Chalice of the Void has been pretty great in the Red Prison Shell. So this deck has a ton of early plays. Like, since you have these Ancient Tombs and these Lotus Petals, you can do any of the two-drop plays, and potentially the three-drop plays as well on turn one, which means that, like, you have 21 real spells that can matter. I, I guess the Jitte doesn't matter turn one, but you get way more spells that matter on turn one, and you have, like, some some strong follow-up endgame. Um, and the sideboard feels pretty solid as well. Like, you get six removal spells for, for matchups like Delver, where, like, you need to deal with some of your opponent's threats. For for combo decks, we have like these seven cards, and then we have Armageddon's for when I want to have fun and make control players cry. The City of Traders not worth the drawback in this deck. Yes, I believe that is not worth the drawback. Um, while it's a very powerful card, Eldrazi Temple does the same thing for most of the threats without being sacrificed. Are we supposed to have additional ways to power out turn one three drops? So I think it just Lotus Petal is fine. I don't I don't think we need to go that deep. Like we also can't three drop most of the time unless we draw this. So even if we made that like a different card like Chrome Mox or Mox Diamond or something like that, it still wouldn't be good. Oh, and this is 59, so there's probably supposed to be a second Jitte here. And it just failed to upload. Yeah, the, so the, the problem with the Moxin in this exact shell is that I think it's 11. 11 of our creatures are Devoid, and we have Chalice and Jitte, 
So something like a Chrome Mox isn't all that great. And if you want to play Mox Diamond, you probably need to like increment the lands up one more. Um, so I don't know that that's the best either. Uh, Containment Priest for Displacer is a very real combo, but I don't know that it's better than just like playing Rest in Peace and Fairy as more generic, strong sideboard cards than Containment Priest is. Like, I'm not overly sold on Containment Priest, generally speaking, but maybe because I have the Displacer engine, it's fine. I don't know. Alright folks, so like maybe this weekend I'll do the bonus stream for hitting 800 followers. That that seems about right. And now we're now we're getting to the point where some of the, the bonus streams are fun, right? So the uh, the 900 follower stream is, is going to be elves and, and I'll play with the enemy for a change. And then when we hit a thousand followers for my big celebration, we're gonna we're gonna play some big stupid stuff and, and we're gonna play some Nick Fit. Uh, so those are on the horizon now. So thank you all for watching tonight. Again, my name's Phil Gallagher. Uh, I run Thraven University, and if you enjoy, you know, Thalia and Friends of Thalia, this is a channel for you, and consider following and subscribing if you're really enjoying it. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and turn you over to some more legacy content. Uh, I think I saw someone else who was streaming, and I'm going to go ahead and host them. Cheers. Have a good night.